Good afternoon and welcome to a special webinar today during Red Cloud's virtual one-on-one -on -one Uranium Day. My name is David Talbot, a Managing Director and Head of Research at Red Cloud Securities, and this is our latest Uranium Fireside Chat entitled Demystifying the Nuclear Fuel Cycle. We are pleased to have with us again today Mike Alkin. He's Chief Investment Officer of Lloyd Harbor Capital Management and Principal and Founder of Sachem Co. Partners. This is one of the world's largest uranium funds and a physical uranium investor in the world. So the timing of this discussion I don't think can be any better, with uranium prices up 37% year-to-date to, to 65.50 a pound. The World Nuclear Symposium, Association Symposium was very upbeat earlier this month, probably the best we've seen for about the last 13 years. And last week, the Precious Metals Summit in Beaver Creek even added uranium companies to its list of speakers for the first time. We are about seven weeks away from Red Cloud's fall showcase in, in early November, where we expect personal in-person presentations from close to 25 to uh, 30 uranium companies and perhaps 100 companies overall. So before we go on, I need to discuss some of the fine print. During today's webinar, Mike and I will take time to discuss the uranium market and some recent events. We will then take your questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we do plan to keep this webinar somewhat high level, so we don't plan to discuss any of our top picks directly, but company names may drop during the discussion, and you can certainly reach out to redcloudresearch.com or satchemcove.com if you wish to get more information. For Red Cloud Securities, I highlight, highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures for on any names that you might hear. Now, before we get things started, I'd like to introduce one of the world's leading experts in both the uranium equities and uranium markets. So, Red Cloud has had the pleasure of having Mike speak at several of our, our uranium conferences over the past couple of years. Mike Alkin is the founder and principal of Satchem Cove Partners. He's a general partner of Satchem Cove Special Opportunities Fund. He's also the chief, chief investment officer of public equities of Lloyd Harbor Capital Management, who is the investment manager of the fund. He has nearly 25 years of hedge fund experience with extensive short selling experience across several industries. And prior to that, he, he was an analyst and partner for seven years at Knott Partners and held similar roles at Walker Smith Capital, Zwig, Domena, and Windsor Partners before that. So, Mike, thank you for joining us again today. It's a really exciting time to be in the uranium market and uranium equities. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, it certainly is pretty exciting time right now. Yeah, so Mike and I recently returned from the World Nuclear Association Symposium in London. And, you know, I've been going to this conference since 2007. It's more of a nuclear industry conference, utilities, government, service providers, etc. And attendance was up to maybe six, 750, 800 this year. And if I had to guess, the uranium industry may have had maybe 15 to 20 percent of the attendees at the conference. Uh, there were a handful of brokers and investors at the symposium, but I'd argue that it's not really an investor conference. Uh, because this is an odd numbered year, 2023 saw the release of WNA's biannual nuclear fuel report. This is a widely quoted supply demand report, which we will get to a little bit more later. But I'd say there were a lot more uranium companies in the bar, the boardrooms, the restaurants that just didn't sign up. You know, we had 60 people at our dinner from 28 different companies and 12 side buy clients at our, at our dinner alone. But Mike, I guess, what was your impression of the mood of the conference this year, uh, particularly in contrast to last year or past years? Yeah, Dave, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, you've been going to these for many years. I started going in 2017. Uh, and in 2017 was really the, the trough of, of bearishness, late 16, early 17. The price of uranium, just for context, you mentioned it's it's in the mid 60s right now. It's back then it was in late 16, early 17, it was 18, 19, 20 dollars a pound. Um, and so going there to the World Nuclear Association and other like industry events, it was very dour. 
Um, if you think back, Dave, at that, that, that time, the top five producing nuclear power countries in the world, you know, you look at uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, the U.S., uh, the, the, the French, uh, the U.K., you, you had all these, you, know, you had what were big, large producers of nuclear power were having policies in place that or, or economics that were making it difficult for these uh, for nuclear to to really thrive and grow. And it was more of in the West it was more declining and it was more of if there was a growth story, which was very mild at the time, it was more in the East. Um, but it was so that was reflected in people's attitudes. People were more concerned about having jobs in the West to get their kids through and pay for, for college than they were uh, about buying uranium. They just thought there would be a lot of it. So you, you fast forward to today um, and it's, you know, it's 180 degrees different. Those top five countries have all had policies put in place that are supporting nuclear. It's become bipartisan and it's just a completely different, uh, a completely different um, uh, attitude from the people in attendance on top of the number of people who are attending. So it's, it's been quite a sea change. Absolutely. I think 2017 might have been 18 bucks a pound. And that was pre-Section 232 review that was instigated by a couple of those U.S. utilities, or, sorry, U.S. uranium companies. Uh, and I don't think we really knew how correct they would be back then. Given the, the events that have happened, so um, yeah, moving on this, this nuclear fuel report from the World Nuclear Association, probably the most quoted uranium supply demand report that's out there, which is you know both good from a marketing standpoint from the industry, but not maybe bad from a methodology standpoint, at, at least in our opinion, as I put words in Mike's mouth here. Mike, why don't we start with some highlights of the report? You know, starting with demand demand here, and I I do believe that the WNA strength is uh, you know is excuse me strength is with demand given that nuclear utilities make up a bulk of its clientele so we, we do see strong demand this year strong growth we've got smrs reactor extensions government support security supply new builds and and really annual growth is rising to about 3.6 percent annually up from 2.9 percent so what what's your take on the demand portion of the report so dave it's it's one of these things for those who follow energy and follow uh, other industries where there's big supply demands, commodities, you know, it's like, think of the IEA, right? Um, I, I find their supply demand work um, relatively useless, but it's a benchmark, right? But it's going to be revised all the time and there's no repercussions if it's revised. Um, and and uh, our view early on, you know, when I started uh, really in 2016, 2017, diving into this sector and doing our own modeling, because besides you and a couple of others, most people had left the industry, right? It was it was pretty dour. Um, so we looked at the industry forecasters work, we looked at the WNA's work, and, and we had big disagreements with both supply, demand, inventory at the time. And what, what our view was, was it was very of the moment. It was very, it was laced with recency biases. Um, and having studied, you know, if you want to know where it's going, you got to know where it's been, right? So we spent a lot of time understanding prior cycles and understanding and watching how the evolution of the forecasting occurred. And what occurred was as prices rose, so too did their optimism for demand and vice versa on supply. When, when um, prices went down, all of a sudden the, the cost curve, which once you got past the state-owned producers, was uh, driven by pure play uranium folks who needed to account for null and sustaining costs. It, it went, it got cut in half, basically, almost by the forecaster, um, because they just assumed they'd all stay open, and they made a mistake there because then you start to see twenty-five percent supply. So, to to the point of what do I, what do I think? Of course, we have to know and appreciate it, but when you you need to also know how that sausage gets made, and there's some really good, smart people on those committees who do good work, but there's a lot of agendas on there, right? So you have people who don't want to show really positive results because it makes it harder with their policymakers when they're starting to get support. Um, you have people who are going to be in the market needing to buy uranium, and they're, they're part of the people making these numbers. So, you know, you have to understand where, where, where the genesis of all that is. That being said, it, it's markedly better than it had been 
it shows a growth profile, I think three plus percent for nuclear out several years. Like I said, back in 17, there was basically no growth. So that that is quite positive and, and they show a, a strong demand case. Um, so uh, again, we use it as a bogey, as a benchmark to understand what's going to form consensus. WNA numbers will, some of the industry consultants numbers will, but we certainly don't use that as, as our numbers. We, we come at it different, uh, you know, uh, differently from an economic and commercial standpoint. And as you know, Dave, in the WNA, um, they're not allowed to talk about the price of a commodity of, of uranium when it's when they're for, forecasting supply. So how do you how do you put supply stacks in when you're they literally can't take into account the price of that supply? which they then called unspecified supply. So it's, it is what it is, but it's something that's out there. Yeah, you know, the, as I mentioned at the top, this is the most uh, quoted uh, report in the industry. Yeah. Do you see this as a big shortcoming, you know, to be, to be honest, despite the, the fact that, that it had a very positive tone this year and some of the positive highlights, uh, which we're going to talk about. I, I haven't spent much time looking at the actual supply-demand numbers myself. Uh, you know, how does one come up with this marginal cost model when prices and costs aren't considered? So a really good point, Dave. I think those who are inclined to do their own modeling will be able to get there, right? There's enough information. It's it's a lot of work, but there's enough information on both the demand and supply side if you if if you want to put the effort and time in to get there. Uh, if you're if someone's going to use these, they're always going to it's 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 a tail chasing exercise because it it, it adapts to the environment. It, it's I mean, I could go on for hours and I'll bore the heck out of people, but I, I can't emphasize how many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours we have studying the forecasters. And it's it, 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 it's absurd how wrong it has been and we think will continue to be. But it is what it, it's the best that's out there. So you go with it. Exactly. You know, uh, you use it as the benchmark to know what people are going to be forming their opinions about. Exactly. So uh, on the supply side, obviously, the World Nuclear Association does state, or at least this report does state, there's enough uranium in the world based on the Red Book of Resources. A uh, statement to which I'm a little bit skeptical is getting it out of the ground is still an issue, whether due to economic reasons or permitting or whether or not those resources are real certainly they're not compliant in uh, Canada or, or jork so you know the report does say ultimately supply cannot keep up with this demand and it was specifically stated that not all not not all buyers will be able to procure uranium going forward so particularly past 2028 and I think that's a pretty strong statement so ultimately I think more mines are required but do, do you think the WNA is painting a too rosy a picture for supply? Yeah, I, I, I think without taking price into account in this whole unspecified category, I think it's a waste of their time um, to, to do it. Um, people like to quote things. and uh, There's a lot of uranium resource in the world. That's not new. Um, that's well known. It's not how much supply, it's how economic is the supply. How far developed is the supply? What's the timeline between bringing on the necessary supply the incentive price to get there, uh, and and where are these companies in the development stage? Don't forget from 2011 to you know right after Fukushima through really 2021 2022 there was the uh, capex imploded. Companies were just trying to keep the lights on, so there has been a significant delay in bringing new projects on. So is there enough uranium in the world to meet future demand? Sure. Yep. Can you always find new and more economical? Yes. But do we know that? So it's it's how economical is the uranium? So it's a very big difference. Not is there known resources? Like you said, Dave, there's countries it's never going to come out of. And, and they don't they I don't think they do a really good job of headlining that. Right. It's but but again, even though even though we can find great fault with the report, it, it's much more positive than it's been. And, and since I've been looking at it, so to their credit, um, they're, you know, they're moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. 
So ultimately, we do need incentive for additional production, and that means higher prices, right. and perhaps some support from governments as far as helping reducing permitting timelines as well. Uh, do, you, do you agree with both those statements, pricing and, and permitting? Help? Yeah, I think you need uh, a pricing needs to move higher, right? For especially in the world we're living in now, it's geopolitically realigning, right? If we think about seventy percent of the production of the uranium coming out of the east. Uh, while 70% is consumed in, in the West, there's, there's a realignment shift that's taking place. Uh, people like to look for sanctions. Well, it, the, the utilities are starting to self-sanction. The security of supply is always paramount for them. And so they're starting to, to, to bring that to the fore. Um, so when you start to realign that, you, you have higher cost uh, production in the West. And so natural inflation uh, uh, is taking it, mining inflation, uh, and this and, and the issues, it, it's higher costs. So yeah, that, that requires higher pricing. Uh, and, and, and to the utilities credit, and I can't believe I'm saying this as someone who has watched this very closely uh, for seven, eight years, uh, there's a recognition on their part that that needs to happen. They're, they're not screaming, saying, let me be the first one. Some are quietly doing it. But it, that that has started. That recognition is taking place. And as far as the the permitting and the process, uh, the permitting and licensing, depending where you are, you know, right? If you're in the U.S., um, right, they make it more challenging um, to do that. But I think you can always have uh, good. But for the, like uh, uh, Australia too, can be more mining friendly. Canada is pretty good, obviously, uh, uh, but. Uh, parts of Canada. Part, exactly, parts of Canada. Uh, the U.S. could be more mining friendly. And I, I think you're, you know, you're starting to see it loosen up. You're starting. But w what we notice is just attitudinally, you, you are seeing this bipartisan recognition for nuclear power. And what's coming along with that is, OK, the world's changed. Uh, and therefore, we need to, to support the, the Western miners of the stuff that makes nuclear power work. And so, you know, you're starting to, to get there. Now, we think the market will get you there before you'll get it. If, you, if you're ever waiting for the government, good luck, you're going to get run over, right? So the markets are getting you there um, and, and at a much more accelerated pace than they have been. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people's perceptions change as well, you know, over time, you know, we, we, uh, we, we've got, Let's say Quebec. Don't expect any mining in Quebec anytime soon. Uranium mining is probably Virginia and even northern Colorado at this point as well. 20 years down the road, who knows? You know, yeah. We, uh, well, you know, think about the uh, U.S. They'll talk about Biden said you can't mine near the Grand Canyon, right? So like to show you how headline driven some people are, I'll, I'll get I'll get messages to me saying, oh, boy, is, does this kill the uranium thesis? I'm like, oh, my oh, my goodness, like literally you've done no work because that you wouldn't even ask that question. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of understanding, matching up the permitting, the licensing, the, the incentive prices geographically and, and where they are in relation to, to where they, they need to get to. Right. So um, unspecified uranium supply. I apologize for the phone going in the background. I can't shut the house phone off. So uh, unspecified uranium supply a term used a lot in the report, essentially from, you know, essentially it's supply that is required, but the WNA doesn't know where it's coming from, you know, right. whether it's commercial inventories or unspecified secondary or project expansion, potential supply down the road. What, what do you make of this term? I, I think it's a joke. Um, I mean, you're asking my opinion. I've been doing this for a while now. Um, yeah, remember, I, I mean, we're coming at it from uh, showing up at these conferences, $18 a pound, $19 a pound, $20 a pound, saying we see a, a deficit building. Um, you know, you've been public. I've been very public about our view that there were structural deficits coming down the road. Um, so I, I just think it, it, it's either there or it's not, and, and, and talk about the economics associated with it, right? So where is it coming from? If it's unspecified coming from secondary supply, well, good luck, because secondary supply has imploded. Inventories have, have cratered as they've been drawn down immensely over the last uh, 12, 11, 12 years. Um, 
what was once a good source of secondary supply in the form of underfeeding and without getting into a, a drawn out technical discussion, the enrichers were able to, during a period of excess capacity, they were able to use some of the uranium that was sent to them and uh, keep it simple on that front. But it was, you know, it was a, uh, if you think about, it was, it could have been 20-ish million pounds per annum. And that was a lot in a, in a, in a world at the time that was using 170, 180. Um, that's, that's gone. Um, there's, uh, and, and there's the potential for it to go the other way where the uh, enrichers will need to go buy uranium. Uh, the inventories are down commercially. Um, so, you know, to say it's, it's unspecified, we need it. Well, it's not there. Um, to say that we can't look at the economics associated with building this mine, but we know it's out that mi these mines are out there. Um, you know, that's like, uh, like a child running through uh, that, the, the dark house uh, covering their ears saying, la, 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 la. I hope nothing's there. Y you can't do that, right? That's not how the world works. So um, their unspecified supply, again, to their credit, they recognize there's something. They're not saying it's not that they're not there. You need more incentivized, uh, you need higher prices, you need more uranium so to there, but, but it's not capturing uh, the real issue. Right. As you know, Dave, you've been a, a mining out. You're a geologist and you've watched this for many, many years. Uh, how many of these projects that are out there that everyone's jumping up and down are going to get built? How many really get built? Well, I can tell you in the uranium world, only a few um, in, in the last cycle. So, yeah, it's um, it's a challenge uh, for uh, for the industry. It's there. It will be incentivized. Reactors will not run out of fuel because there's not enough. There's uranium there and the markets are are getting you there, um, you know, uh, and and it, what happens too is what you see here is as as prices rise, remaining inventories become dearer. People don't want to let them go, and you know you think you think about last cycle, Dave. Uh, you know, if you it, oftentimes, and I've said this before, so I sound like a broken record, but but it's I think it's important to understand history. In price of uranium in two thousand was seven bucks, and Everyone who pays attention, so the 20 people in the world who, even, who care about nuclear uranium will say, well, in the last cycle, um, Cigar Lake flooded and that caused this big price spike. And, and that partially, that Cigar, the truth there is Cigar Lake did flood. The other truth is after that, prices did move higher. What's left out of that is Cigar Lake, which was supposed to be the largest mine in the world coming online in 2007, had a flood in 06. And so it became apparent it wasn't coming on for many years. But prior to that, the price of uranium was $7 in OO. And it, it was in the mid 40s before we ever had that issue, mid to high 40s, before that we had that issue. It had moved up 7x. So the inventories weren't what people thought they were. The prices were moving higher. And interestingly, if, if you were sitting in a fuel buyer's seat in uh, September of 06, before the it flooded in October, and you said, "All right, I need to go. I need to go contract out six, seven years in the future. What's what's the market supply demand forecast look like?" And if you take the numbers back then, you will see that over that period there was over 120 million pounds of a surplus in the market. So a month later, Cigar Lake floods, and a couple of months later, late 06, early 07, it becomes apparent that Cigar Lake will not be coming online. Well, what winds up happening? The the so you now the when the forecasts come out in the first quarter of 07, use the Bellwether Consulting firm, they show a surplus, not 120, 25 million pounds, it went up to 225 for the next six years. What they found more demand, or they found less, uh, uh, there was uh, less demand, there was some other mines that came online. So in a, in a period where there was a forecasted surplus of uranium. The, the contracting cycle kicked off and prices then went from the high 40s up into at 1.137 in those dollars, close to 200 in today's dollars. Now, fast forward to this cycle. You, you've had similar under contracting, like in the last cycle, they were drawing down inventories for over a decade. Uh, they were replacing their, their annual consumption at about a third here and the, so they use a pound they replace a third for they did that for over a decade similarly here over a decade it was about 37 percent replacement rate 
So what do you do? You're drawing down inventories. So, but the difference here is even the forecaster, the, the bellwether forecaster, the, uh, the WNA, who's no, we think's numbers are so low. When we see that, even they will show deficits out six years by 2030 into the future. So you have a scenario where the utilities are starting to come back into the market and price discovery is occurring in long-term contracting. And that's where we think, obviously, that when this geopolitical realignment, even before that, though, the, the price to incentivize new production need, need, needed to go higher. And that's what we're starting to see. Yeah, 137 bucks a pound in June 2007. That's the month I started covering uranium. <laughs> Fortunately, unfortunately. So uh, you, know, you also talked about how many mines to get built. You know, we, we had pretty good prices back in 2007, as you uh, anticipated. And my yeah. forecast, my initial report uh, late in that year, I forecast startup of maybe 20, 25 different projects. And really only four or five of them actually started. You know, right. Langer, Cigar, Lost Creek, Kale Kara, and Husa. Uh, yeah. Everything else uh, we're, we're still waiting for, believe it yeah. or not. You know, even through Fukushima, you know, we we still had prices up in the 75 to 90 range. But, uh, you know, just to take us back, you, you segued nicely into the secondary supply there at the, be at the beginning of your talk there. Uh, I want to take us back to there for a second. You know, sure. secondary supply is in anticipated to drop. Right now, about 76% of supply comes from uranium mines, meaning 24% of current supply is covered by secondary. So 40 to 50 million pounds or so. Mm -hmm. And that's expected to drop down to about 8% in coming years, at least according to WNA. Uh, you know, inventories, as you said, have been dropping since 2016. Physical, invest, US, uh, physical uranium investors aren't necessarily selling. Uh, but the enrichers, you know, they're, they're going to be busier for working for the utilities and less underfeeding. So, you know, and, and the other thing we didn't talk about is the HEU agreement is gone. Right. And that was about 25 million pounds that people anticipated to disappear. What I don't think people realize is the LEU, uh, LEU agreement would come online for 12 to 13 million pounds or so of supply. But, David, yeah. it, you just I mean, you nailed that. So um, one of the things when you look at last cycle, right, so those who want to do the work on, on what it looked like last cycle, if you looked at industry forecaster reports, you would and consulting firms, uh, even today, if you looked at what they last cycle looked like, they would show. Let's let's take Western inventories. Um, they would they let's, let's take U.S. inventories. They would show where you can get the publicly available information from the EIA. You would see it would show utility inventories and then broker, trader, and other inventories. And so, if you looked at them, let's say uh, uh, in the last right before the run-up, 2004, 2005, you know, 90, 90, 95, 100 million pounds, and not 89 million, something like that, in that ballpark, we have the report, the numbers. Um, and, and so that would be, uh, there were higher, uh, there were lower utility inventories, but, but higher trader, uh, producer, and other inventories. Um, and then you start really 28, 19, 20, 21, you know, you, there was, so here's, Here's the inventories now at that time, 2018, 19, 20. And then here was then. And you say, oh, OK, well, you know, there were uh, about two years of inventory back then, a little bit less. And then uh, you would look at it for 2019, 2020 and say, well, there's it could be three years. But now utilities in the West and in, in the U.S., they want two years of inventory in Western Europe. They want three years. So if you're talking three years back then, well, it's not that big a deal. You're not talking 10 years. And, and we'll get to that in a second because we'll get to how this industry uh, uh, positions what their inventory levels are. Um, and so, so when you look though at those at those inventory levels back then, you brought up a, one of the key points that doesn't is, gets completely glossed over, and we think it's one of the most important was if you were a U.S. utility, you knew that the 1993 to 2013 time period was the megatons to megawatts program where people familiar with the industry would, would know that the the US incentivized the Russians to downblend 1600 intercontinental nuclear missiles from highly enriched uranium down to low enriched uranium so they could then send in up to 20 22 25 million pounds a year of uranium into the US market for consumption in reactors 
So when you look at that prior inventory, no, it wasn't sitting on the balance sheets of the utilities, but they knew they had this amazing off balance sheet asset that was pumping uranium into the market. So they didn't need to flex up their balance sheets or lock up the contracts. That's gone. That doesn't exist. Cheap, anymore, right? cheap uranium. Too. It was cheap uranium. It was there and that doesn't there. So now, you know, when, when you think of the inventory thing is really, Dave, what triggered me to, to go ahead and dig further. Uh, 2016, I was doing my own modeling on demand and supply and trying to figure it all out. I, I love what you said, an expert. Uh, I'm not an expert in anything. I'm not, I can't even take out the track well. So I'm really not an expert at uranium. I just, I happen to be looking at a market that not a lot of people have been looking at. And so, and it's, you know, it's really fourth grade math on supply and demand. The enrichment math is a little more complicated and that takes a while to figure out. But once you get it, you know, you put it in a spreadsheet, you got it. But so really not being an expert, just modeling out how many pounds does a reactor use and how many, you know, doing that math and, and then learning about enrichment math and figuring out a pound of uranium isn't always a pound for a reactor. You, and, you know, we could talk about that. But but at the end of the day, uh, the supply side you do. And but then we, I got to the inventory. So uh, when, when, I, when, I, when I went to the first big conference I went to, there had just been a report that was out there that talked about all these inventories that were, that were out there in the world. And it was something like a billion four. And, and let's round up. It was like at that time, it was 170, 180 million pounds uh, of demand. So it round up to 200 million. And, and I had the good fortune of being invited uh, to a dinner with um, uh, some of the largest fuel buyers in the, in the U.S., which are the largest in the world. And uh, I mean, I was uh, I, I didn't belong at the, at the my IQ didn't belong at that table. They're all nuclear engineers, really smart people. Uh, but we were sitting there and talking and, you know, I asked about inventory because when I went through the inventory report, what, what I noticed was, wait a second, there's not 1.4 billion usable pounds. I didn't know the term mobile at the time, but I, I thought you can't access these strategic at different government levels, certain depleted stuff. And when I went through all of it, I don't know, I was like 500, 600 million pounds. But it, you know, it's, it, it's not a billion four. And so if the world's using at the time, 170, 180, all right, you're at three plus years of inventory, maybe you push to four, but it's not, it's, it's not 10 and 12. And so as I was at this dinner talking to people and, I, and these fuel buyers, I asked them about the supply demand and when, when they would start buying, they said, why would we buy prices at that time where, you know, 18, 20 bucks, this is going to keep going lower. It's going to go to 15, it's going to go to 10. And I'd say, well, why? Well, well, there's 1.4 billion pounds of uranium. Don't you read the reports, knucklehead? You know, uh, and I was a knucklehead at the time, but I was stumbling through and uh, I'm probably, and I still am, but um, as I was stumbling through it, what, what dawned on me was they really didn't read that. And I know that sounds real. It's, it sounds silly. I don't mean it to sound pompous. Um, I don't mean it to sound arrogant because like I said, these are very smart people. They're nuclear engineers for the most part, but what they do because of the density of, of nuclear fuel and uranium, um, the, the, the input, the uranium itself, you know, the, the whole cycle, we'll talk about mining and in converting it and enriching it, fabricating it and getting, that's 20, 25% of the cost of a reactor. The uranium is pick a number, five, eight, 10, 12%. Some years really, if it's really low, it could be less, but it's not that big. And there's no substitute. If you, if you rely on a one gigawatt plus reactor or something like that, you, you need that to work. You need uranium. So uh, what, what it's gas, natural, uh, natural gas and coal, those input costs are up to 90% of the input costs, right? So it's very different. And so I realized that these, at that dinner, these are not commercial creatures. I asked them, how do you get paid? Do you get paid to call bottoms? Nope. How do you get paid? We get paid, it doesn't work. Really, how do we get paid? They got mad at me. I wasn't asking how much they made, but it's, are you incentivized? Is there any incentive for you to understand, call the bottom in a price uranium? No. Our incentive is to secure uranium and make sure we have it. Where that price is, it is. But there's so much inventory we're not going to need, is what they said. And it was there that I realized that they were headline reading. 
they were suffering from recency bias and they wouldn't lose their job if they got it wrong. And so that's 18, 19, 20 dollar uranium. And that that was probably that's when I literally said, I, got, I, I have to express the view here because this is a cohort. There's Wall Street's basically gone for the most part. Uh, investors, you know, uh, sell side's gone. Investors are gone. And, and, and the cohort buying this stuff doesn't even care and they're not doing the work. Um, that, and that's what you have. Fast forward, um, you know, the awareness is rising prices. It's, it's not a recognition that work's been done. Contracting is now picking up. You're entering a contracting cycle. But those inventories now, you're, you're pushing below two years in the U.S. and Western Europe below three years. Uh, the sources of secondary supply, which were um, underfeeding, and, and, and just I mean to keep it very hundred thousand foot level, uh, in periods of excess capacity, the enrichers have the ability because of the technology within there uh, to use less uranium that is delivered to them. I'll just keep it simple. So they could they could sweat their uh, centrifuges more and keep the difference and sell that into the open market, and so. All of the, util- the uranium delivered to the to the enricher by the utility uh, didn't all need to get used, and it was free for the enricher to use the excess and sell it out there. And that's what they did. Well, that that also works in reverse. So when there's not enough capacity, like you're seeing now, um, they need to put more uranium into those centrifuges. Um, yep. So you're in a situation where the megatons and megawatt program does not exist. Uh, the Russian supply there was some russian underfeeding is not making its way here uh the uh and and the underfeeding that was there uh is now going to be reversing and you don't have the inventory levels so it's a tough tough to count on secondary supply yeah no absolutely and you know a lot of those inventories certainly weren't in usable products it uh, wasn't in nuclear fuel which is very specific to different reactors and you know depleted tails inventory might be huge but doesn't maybe not necessarily useful without spending a lot on enrichment which might actually be the bigger problem so um you know we also expect governments to be selling less material from inventory Uh, you know in fact i think bill last week bill sheriff he's chairman of encore stated at beaver creek that he believes the U.S. government will actually increase how much they might spend on the U.S. uranium reserve. You know, they spent 75 million bucks earlier this year, and I think 68 million was on uranium and the rest on conversion. Many of us uh, anticipate 150 million to be sunk next year by the U.S. government, but that might even be more, according to Bill, you know, especially as, you know, new fuel types are here required, you know, for SMRs. And, you know, you're, you're based in the U.S. So, you know, Mike, what are you hearing out of Washington these days, either about the the U.S. uranium reserve, or anything that they might be helping to incentivize the fuel cycle here. So I go back to what I said prior, Dave. You know, we we don't put much weight in what the government's doing. Um, you know, we just think given the, given the opportunity, they'll screw it up. Given the opportunity, they'll disappoint. It's just I, I was taught that a long time ago on this stuff. So we come at it really from a commercial standpoint. Anything they do would be gravy. Uh, it's similar to the U.S. though. Like if you look about the U.S., you go back to 1981, right? The right the peak of the Cold War, roughly, um, and the United States was using 50, 45 to 50 million pounds a year, depending on the year of uranium in its nuclear reactor fleet, which is 20 percent of the electricity in the U.S. And um, at that time, the U.S. was producing 44, 45 million of those pounds. So energy independent on its nuclear and you could buy a little from Canada and Australia friends there. Uh, but, but that was it. Fast forward to 2021, uh, produced zero, I think. And, and where did they get half of it? Russia, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And so, you know what? Uh, it, it, that's just not made sense to us. Back in 2018, we bought, we bought uh, when we started the fund, not shortly thereafter, uh, I started uh, with my partner. We were uh, uh, buying leases on, on Bureau of Land Management land in Wyoming and, and Colorado uh, because that, that we just thought that was it was untenable. And so what we think here is, and we used to say this to, to some of the 
U.S. Uh, company heads that we would speak with um, is sit tight. You know, our view is is there's a deficit forming, and you're going to get the prices you need. You it costs more to produce uranium in in the United States than it does in in the East. Uh, that that's a fact. However. You're chewing through the cost curve. If you took all the state-owned pounds that are out there, plus the byproduct that comes out of Olympic Dam, which is you know, eight to ten million pounds a year, and you took all the state-owned capacity, not not production, you're at 110, 115 million pounds. Well, demand is well north of 200 as you start to go. So the U.S. is going to need uh, uranium. The producers. Right. So the producers need 65, 70, 75, 80, 85 in some cases. And so the instinct by many of the uranium CEOs that we've known over the years is pound DC, get the get in there and talk. And they do a really nice job. They 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 represent themselves well and 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 they, they're knocking on doors and, and they're making progress. I don't think it's needed. I think it's nice and maybe the money comes. But I think the commercial market itself will get it there. I, we, we think price price discovery that's occurring now gets it there. The rest to us is is cherry on top, gravy, however you want to term it. Okay. So so security of supply, obviously the huge factor here. And you just mentioned, you know, Russia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. You know, the only other real names out there are Canada, Australia, Niger, Namibia, right? So you know, Russia dominates the enrichment industry. You know, and especially since the invasion yep. of Russia, right. yeah, sorry, from Russia, yep. of Ukraine, you know, countries are becoming increasingly concerned about supply. Yes. So do you anticipate a second uranium price to emerge, you know, depending on whether you're you, You've had it before, a, bif a bifurcated price, yet it did exist before. You used to see in the old price forecasting, eastern price and, and you know, western price. Uh, so that would not surprise me as you think about the geopolitical landscape that's occurring and you think about that that is uh, not occurring, but you think about the shifts that are taking place. And you think, about, you know, you mentioned Niger and Namibia, right? That's um, the Chinese have a strong foothold into Namibia. Uh, uh, the French are in Niger, but you got it's under coup right now. Right. So stuff happens. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, you know, I do think that um, you could the Western price will emerge um, as as time evolves. And I think you're, you know, as you, you mentioned Russia's role. It's uh, for those who are learning this, you know, there's different stages of the f fuel cycle. You'll hear people say nuclear fuel cycle. So there's the mining phase, and then it gets converted to UF6, uranium hexafluoride, uh, and then it goes to be enriched, and then it goes to be fabricated. Uh, you know, the, the, the Russians are, you know, pick a number, 12, 14 percent of, of uranium. Uh, they're they're close to 30 percent of conversion. Uh, and then they're they're over 40 percent of enrichment. And in those markets, conversion and enrichment is only a couple of players, two or three players, very small, four players uh, and state owned, privately owned. So um, the fuel buyers as Russia went into Ukraine, as things are starting to emerge, as China's flexing their muscle, uh, you're starting to see them gobble up enrichment and conversion services. Both of those are services that rely on the product. So if we think about the, the way a enrichment service is priced, it's called a separative work unit, uh, a SWU. It's a unit of work. Um, SWU bottomed in 16 at 35 ish dollars. Uh, today, you know, it's 150. Um, it's doubled since last year. The service to convert uranium to UF6 uh, in, in 1617 was $4 per kilogram. Today, it's 40 per kilogram. Uh, and in the last year, it's or the last two years, it's really gone up significantly as you had some capacity closures. So you need to see incentivization there to increase capacity as you shift away from Russia. And the same thing is happening in uranium. Uh, so there is there's this transition that's taking place. And if, if none of the geopolitical stuff ever happened, if, if Russia didn't walk into Ukraine, at the end of the day, there's not enough uranium to meet the, the, the demand that's out there. Um, 
But now that you've got these geopolitical realignments taking place, like in, in many other industries, um, you could see two prices emerge. Yeah, with higher enrichment prices, it's uh, it's cheaper to buy new uranium mm -hmm. than it is than, than enriching low enriched uranium. Yeah. At least good for the producers, assuming they have it. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, spot uranium prices up thirty seven percent year to date, over sixty five bucks a pound here. Well, what are the main reasons you see for this price appreciation here? You know, it, last time around, it was really spot physical uranium trust that did a lot of buying, but they're yeah. they're on the sidelines right now. Yeah, they've been Is on it? the sidelines for quite some time. You know, we we have a, a unique view into the market because, in addition to owning a project, in addition to owning the equities, we buy physical uranium. So, uh, and as you know, Dave, it's not an electronic market. It's not like a, a it's, it's very opaque. It's phone calls. Uh, I've, I've got X amount for sale. Uh, you know, it's very, very opaque. There's a handful of traders in the world. Um, and, you know, what we can see is it's a very, very tight spot market. If, if you were to go in for more than just a little, you know, not, not just 100,000 pounds, they trade in 100,000 pounds lots, if you will. Um, if you if you were to try and, and gobble up not too much, you know, prices are going to move a bunch. And as it goes higher, people are stepping out and saying, well, I'm not going to sell what I have. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a and what 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 winds up happening is so investors will tend to look at the spot price of uranium. And there are times where that's a really, really valuable tool when there's excess surplus in the market because it serves as a surplus disposal market. And, and as you know, over time, 80 to 85% of all uranium bought and sold occurs in the, in the contract market, right? Six, seven, eight, 10, 12 year deals. Um, but when there's excess uranium, like post Fukushima and this 13% of world supply, Japan went offline, of world demand went offline, it backs up and you, it winds up into the open market. It goes into spots. Some years you saw, you know what normally you might see you know, you could see 30, 40 million pounds trade in the spot. You could see, you were seeing 100 million pounds, uh, that type of thing. And there just weren't a lot of buyers. And so that's a that's a good sign. It's a surplus disposal. That gives you a sense. But then as that starts to get dwindled down um, and contracting starts to occur, the real price discovery is in the contract market, right? And that's where, uh, you know, you're seeing today, you know, the, the prices are, you got to go understand too how to, and I'll get back right back to spot, but uh, let, well, let me just finish spot. So spot is tight. Um, if I went in willy nilly and said I want to buy a bunch, like I if I if I went in and said, oh gosh, I just need to buy X, uh, a whole bunch of X, uh, several hundred thousand pounds. Um, a couple of years ago, a year ago, I, I would have found it um, easily, and price would have price stayed tight. Um, but it was moving higher. Uh, obviously, it's gone from eighteen to where we are um, over the last several years. That's not the case today. Um, it's a much tighter market now. But what happens, right? Because it's so thin, it's so tight. Um, you have to remember there are utilities now that are starting to contract. You, you know, that I mentioned earlier, the long-term contract market was accounting for 35 to 37 uh, percent replacement rate contracting over the last several years. Last year was in the six and mid 60s. Now you're starting. You're already past that. So you can say a contracting cycle has begun. That being said, you t the, the, the spot price tends to trigger the prices at which the long-term prices will get signed. So utilities are not don't want to go in and, and top up because some of them have been left short. Some of them have uh, let it go too low. Uh, traders have to. They don't want to run in and jam it. Enrichers need uranium. Um, so what winds up happening is there are periods of time where when you see rapid price rises, they might just back off from the market for a little bit, you know, a few weeks or a month, an RFP that they were going to get might not come out. Um, and so that could drift and then it could drift down just a little bit. But there's a there's an underlying bid that's there in the market right now. So spot feels tight. Um, you know, we get a look at it from a from a spot buyer. Um, uh, and then on the contract side, you know, it's what you're seeing on the contract side is so uh, a, a utility, uh, a, a utility today uh, would uh, a utility when I first started going to these conferences many years ago, wanted all the market related exposure they can get because prices were going down in their mind. 
that, yeah, sure, we'll take it. They would leave a lot of spot exposure. All right, we'll, we'll just find it in spot. And now they want fixed price contracting. And producers are saying, time out. We want market-related price. You know, for some, they want fixed price. Some of them will want a portfolio. But, but a, a preference for producers is, no, we want market-related and floors and ceilings. So the way the long-term price is calculated is not where the last transaction conducted that the price reporter finds out about. It's, 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 it's the lowest offer. So if there was a contract that went out for proposal, an RFP, request for proposal, and today, you know, the markets, let's say deals are getting signed 65-ish dollars, 63, 65, but somebody bid 60 or 59, even though they didn't offer 59, even though they didn't get filled and it went higher, the price report accounts that lower offer, which is absurd, right? It, it just makes no sense. That's not where it cleared, but that's how it is. But let's use be that as it may. Let's say 60 bucks, round, round, round up. 60 is where the term price is. The contract, uh, the spot price is higher, right? So um, if we're looking at those prices right now, a utility, a, a, a producer will go, and, and say, okay, we want market related, but we'll do floors and ceilings. That, that, that floor is pushing $85.90, or that ceiling, sorry, is pushing $85.90 with floors around where the price is. So think about that. You're a producer, you're signing a contract, you're willing to give a little upside away, but, but you're going to have, that could be 25 to $30 higher, but you know you're locking in a couple bucks lower. That's that's asymmetry. That's and I'm 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 hearing those uh, ceilings are even being escalated. They are being escalated, absolutely. So you've got floors and ceilings with escalator with with escalator or the ceilings with escalator. So absolutely, it's a very yeah. different market. Yeah. Um, than so if Mike, is, is there a possibility that here in the short term, uranium won't be there to buy by the utilities? You know, could be we be faced with a legitimate. There are no pounds available right now. What what happens then? No, I, 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 you know, there's a, price. Price is a good elixir. It will. There's, you know, you, you're on the margin, there's an enormous amount less inventory than there was. But but most of them have coverage a year and a half, two years out. Right. So th there's there's enough to fill that into immediate need where 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 the market's wrestling right now is. All right, your needs are in really 26, 27, 30. We're entering long-term contracts. We're building our book. That's where you're going to have to pay through the nose for, for that versus what you would have paid had you signed it years ago. But no, I don't, you're, I don't think you see anything run out of, you see reactors run out. It tends to be, I, I, I don't even say the bears, but I tend to hear that as the, oh my gosh, reactors are going to close because the material will be found. Um, it's just at what price? Yeah. Another question from the audience, you know, with this kind of supply gap this decade, what do you think will stop the price rise? Is it, mm -hmm. And what might a top price look like? Are we heading to triple digits again? Uh, is, is there any historical context in any commodity market with this kind of supply gap? So it's a, it's a, it's another good question. I'm, you know, I, 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 I look at last cycle and this cycle, right. And prior cycles, and like I said, I, the, the best point of reference I have is, is, is it's, it's market structure, it's incentives. Charlie Munger, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. A fuel buyer is not incentivized to, call, to, 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 to pay the lowest price. So therefore, you know, they will move to where the market moves. And uh, the market's moving higher. Um, in the last cycle, in the last cycle they, they, they bought, to put it in context, Dave, they were buying 50, 60 million pounds, 100 million pounds, 120 million pounds, all those years prior of uranium. They were replacing it at much lower rate of consumption. When they decided the contract cycle was here, on, on demand of 170-ish million, they started contracting at 240 million pounds a year. They went hog wild, right? And if you recall, all they had to do is look at the forecast and say, oh, wait, over my contracting period, there's a surplus in the market, according to the Bellwether Consulting Firm. Um, and and so 
that doesn't exist here today. You don't have the megatons to megawatts. So kind of when I started the fund, I, I, I don't know what the upsides are. I know where they, I think they need to get, I worry about the downside. It's just like, I came at this originally from the eyes, I was a short seller for many years. I came at it through a bear's lens. And every day I wake up today, every day I, we've had the fun, assuming we're wrong and assuming that myriad things can happen that we haven't figured and we, let's go find those things. Here, um, where does pricing go? You know, I don't know. I, I know it needs to get to $85, $90, but that's a meaningless number because last cycle it needed to get into the 60s. It went to $137, $200 today adjusted with a surplus in the market. Today, right, again, you're dealing with people who will panic. And so where that panic takes them, I don't know. Um, but mm -hmm. but we, 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 you know, look at our, we model $80, $85, $90, um, right? Because then that's, that affects the supply stack a little and timing and understanding deficits. But would I be surprised to see uh, it go much higher than that? No, I just don't plan on it. But, you know, anything can happen and probably could. Probably good. Speaking of anything can happen, do you think we'll see some consolidation here? You know, might might BHP, Arano, Cameco uh, start rounding up these assets, or do you foresee some other bigger players getting involved in the Iranian sector? Yeah, you know, it's a. It's we're a starting, we are starting to see oil and gas get it, companies get involved in lithium. Are we going to see the same thing in Iran? You know, one of the things that surprised me, and again, I I'm a generalist, right? So. Like I said, I'm not an expert in anything. I, I can figure out fourth grade supply and demand. But one of the things that um, that struck us in, in 2018 when, when we said we want to get involved in the U.S., let's go buy a private project um, and lease some land and do that stuff, uh, we started uh, talking to geologists who started showing us a bunch of drill data, old logs from the 70s and 80s and 90s and 60s, and it was unbelievable how immersed in the uranium exploration the oil and gas companies were. Um, they were everywhere. And um, so, you know, now that you think about, and we ask ourselves this, like I, I, you think about some of the bigger deposits out there, a oil and gas company, because of the density, you know, of, 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 of uranium, a couple hundred million pounds of uranium can, can be, several billion uh, barrels of oil in a reserve, right? So um, if you were to look at some of the bigger ones, I don't, I have no idea if they're there, but it, would they be surprised me if they're sniffing around? Probably not. These things take a long time, right? Um, but also uranium, like in Europe, it, it nuclear has, it's, it's, it's got the green taxonomy and, and it's, you've gotten bipartisan support you know, you still have the greenies that hate it, but they're even they're starting to come around a little. So, you know, it's a way for an oil and gas company, right, to buy green, if you will. As for the other majors, you know, you never know. Um, would it surprise me? No. Is is nuclear? Does it is it catching a really nice tailwind right now? Yes. Uh, is will there be short? Are there shortages? Yes. Do I think prices keep rising? Yes that typically tends to attract the big mining companies, right? Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's the potential for that uh, consolidation. I just don't know when. Um, you know, that's when it gets to a different level. Uh, you know, what are they willing to pay? What historically, what do they normally do? As you know, they buy, buy at tops and sell at bottoms. Yeah, okay. And, and what do you think the odds are that Sprott Physical Uranium Trust may change the rules here as a buyer of physical uranium, start selling its inventory to utilities? Yeah, I think that's, I, I, I don't think they're going to sell their inventory to start selling. For, so, so those questions come, right? Let's put it in context. What are we talking about deficits? We're talking, depending on the amount of enrichment levels you use, 20 to 40 to 50 million pounds per annum. Right. So those are your structural structural deficits. So for the that's a very popular question that you'll hear. It, 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 I'll, I'll ask that back. What's the context you're asking? Not you, but that person is asking the question. Um, well, um, if they put in pick a number, a few percent redemption, it kind of keeps those people who want to arb this thing, knowing that that any that if there's a, a little bit once a year, maybe that some pounds, a few million pounds can come out into the market. And by the way, 
it, it's not the individual who's going to own it because they, they have to set up storage. I can tell you from being a physical owner of uranium how difficult it is to get storage. There's only a few places that will do it and the, and, 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 the, and the hoops you have to run through. So this is an institutional thing. Could the utilities do it? Think about this. If the utilities did that, that means the utilities would have to go in and buy the equity. And if the utilities wanted to use this trust as a vehicle in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a relatively illiquid Canadian listed trust and were to buy enough uranium, buy enough stock for it to make a difference, to be able to then redeem, they would be raising so much money hand over fist because they'd be driving the price higher than the utilities. So that mechanism's really not there. And the friction costs of doing it. So we, you know, we think it would be kind of really not that impactful um, it, at all. So, okay. But we also don't think Sprott's role in the market now is that big a deal. They, they did a nice job. They cleared up, they cleared up uh, Spot uh, early on, a couple of years ago. But these prices are rising and these guys haven't been in the market for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And there's and there's not that, that much spot material available anymore. Either. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, if they were to, right, if they started buying, I mean, they're they, yep, it, there's not a lot. Yeah. OK, so we're on top of the hour, Mike. Uh, so last question for me is how would you recommend investors play the sector? Oh, um, you know, we don't rec we don't advise anything, as you know, Dave, uh, we you know, look, I, I, I look, it's mining. And as you know, from being mining, you always have to be careful. Um, right. So if you think about the opportunities that are out there for people, uh, you know, there's a lot of smaller companies and, and promotion plays a role in it. So you have to kind of really understand the people involved, their history involved, what's going on. So just buyer beware. Um, there are, uh, you know, way the, there are some ET, a couple of few ETFs that are out there that somebody who doesn't want to do the due diligence can take a look at. Um, there's the bigger producers, right? You know, there's there's multinational, multi-billion-dollar producers that, and people will look at them and and say, well, there's right, they're they're concerned. Some people are concerned there's less upside because they they have a more balanced approach to contracting. Uh, others are uh, uh, we 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 think they do a really good job. Um, you know, there's there's ways to if you want to part uh, the, the, if you want to get into the development, you like developers. So there's producers, then there's the developers, right? And there's those that are the um, the ones that are nearer term developers, and there there are those that are earlier stage development companies. You know, uh, the market will tend to uh, if you look at the last cycle, the market tends to reward those that go from cash consuming to cash producing, right? So you look at those um, and then you then then you get into the uh, uh, there's a, a lot of exploration companies. Um, so, uh, like I said, is there plenty of uranium in the world? Yes, but you can always have more because you never know. Right. There's as I said earlier, Dave, there's geopolitical realignment taking place. So we happen to think the U.S. is a really great place to be, which is why we started leasing land five, uh, six years ago. Um, we think that, you know, there's this this opportunity here. The U.S., you hear now, right, they're, they're starting to produce a little bit again, you know, you're, and people start talking about, well, it went from 45 million pounds in 81 down to zero in 21, roughly. Um, maybe you get to a few million pounds mm -hmm. more. Well, we don't see why there can't be tens of millions of pounds more. So we like the U.S. as a way to, to, to play. And, and people say, well, that will be higher price uranium. You're darn right it will be um, because that's where the market is. Um, and there are shortages and there will be a role for those. So think, you have to think geographically um, about that. There is, um, you know, there are the, like I said, there are the ETFs, uh, there are physical uranium, it, 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 Unless you're an institution, it's really tough to go buy physical uranium. And if you're an institution, uh, almost all of those are not going to want to go through the process of buying it. There's a handful of people who do that. Um, we think it's a wonderful way to get a great look at the market as to what's taking place in the underbelly. And we think that there's a lot of upside to the physical uranium. Um, so, you know, I don't like to make individual selection. I, I don't like to call out individual companies. You know, we, we have a 13F that's out there. Uh, under Lloyd Harbor Capital. Uh, you can see what we own. We only file on U.S. listed 
that companies that have listings in the U.S. So we we own more, uh, uh, but uh, only see the U.S. And you know it wouldn't if you looked at that if you looked at the filing today you'd you'd see we're large shareholders of NextGen of Denison, Cameco uh, at, uh, in, in the last filing. Um, uh, new filings come out soon. Um, so based on last filings, you, you know, you'd see that. And, uh, so, yeah, you know, it's just, um, it, 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 it depends, um, what people's risk appetite is. Absolutely. Okay. So bottom line, we think it's a good time to invest in the uranium sector or in uranium. So we do believe that nuclear power is gaining traction. It continues to supply 10% of global electricity, 25% of all carbon-free power, safe, reliable baseload supply. There's growing support from governments, environmental groups, ESG investors, and the general public. And while we shouldn't run out of uranium, getting it out of the ground is the real issue. So we need more mines. We need to incentivize those mines. We need the governments to work with industry to permit those assets in a timely manner. And meanwhile, security of supply is key. And if we can't incentivize those new mines, some some end users will be left without fuel for their very expensive nuclear reactors. So, so Mike Alkin, Satchman Cove Partners and Lloyd, Lloyd Harbor, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Dave. It was a, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much. Yeah. Great conversation. We will have replays ready uh, out in a few hours, let's hope. Uh, thank you, everybody else, for tuning in. Red Cloud Securities will be back on Monday afternoon when Taylor sits down with Oryx Minerals. So that's Monday, September, I think it's 25th at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave.